Scotland's vaccination programme is lagging behind other nations and was described as slow and stuttering by the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Ruth Davidson. Despite the speed of the vaccine rollout coming under criticism, Scotland's youngest pupils are expected to return to the classroom as early as February the 22nd. Uh, Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, joins us now this morning to discuss these things. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. I think you were able to get 38,000 vaccinations uh, yesterday or in the past 24 hours, which, which must have been a welcome relief for you as First Minister that, mm -hmm. as, as it's been described as slow and stuttering by Ruth Davidson, it feels like that perhaps that, that lumpy supply you were getting mm -hmm. has come good in the last 24 hours. Have you been able to pinpoint why it's been stuttering up till that point? Um, I think I would take issue with that description, but there's a fair question uh, underlying it. Um, firstly, we have seen the rate of vaccination speed up this week. So we, in the last uh, couple of days, have had record numbers carried out on a daily basis, but also proportionately, we've been vaccinating at a higher rate than England. So we're seeing real pace in the programme now. Basically, what we've done in the early stages of the vaccination programme, rightly or wrongly, people can make their own judgment, is focus on getting as high an uptake as possible in the most vulnerable groups. So in care homes, uh, we have now vaccinated, not just offered the vaccination, but vaccinated 98% of older care home residents. And in the over 80 population, we're at about 90% uptake. Now, we focused on trying to maximise uptake in these groups because they are the most clinically vulnerable, those who are most likely to get ill mm. and die. It, it takes longer, particularly in care homes, to do that. But having got these quite extraordinary uptake levels, which I would guess are probably uh, the highest uptake levels in these groups across the UK, we are now speeding up in the younger age groups and we're working in the over 70s now and we are firmly on track to meet the target of having vaccinated all over 70s and everybody in what's called the clinically extremely vulnerable okay. group the, by the middle of February. Your um, national clinical director um, said on, that on Sunday, the January the 31st, when the Scottish vaccination figure was just 9,628. So on Sunday, you're vaccinating less than 10,000 people and you need to be vaccinating 40,000 a day to reach your target of all over 70s by uh, the 15th of February. Uh, Professor Jason Leach said um, Sundays were a bit tricky because GP surgeries were closed. Um, it, it, you're going to struggle, aren't you, if on a day of the week doctors aren't working? Can you not get that? Um, can you not get vaccination hubs to work uh, oh, yeah. on Sundays? So the point Jason was making, which I made earlier in the week, is, and, and this is part of being frank and, and recognising and, and addressing early glitches we're finding in the system. So we have recognised that we seem to be having a dip in the vaccination rate on Sundays, um, and we've been taking action to try to resolve that. Let me be very clear, this is a seven day a week vaccination programme. Not so according to not, the GP surgeries he was well, referring to. Suzanne, if you, if you would allow me to finish the sentence, what I was going to say is not all of the vaccines are being done through GP surgeries. Our GP surgeries are, and I'm generalising here, but in the main, uh, vaccinating the older, more vulnerable patients because it makes sense to have them go to their GP surgeries. We have mass vaccination centres or community vaccination hubs that are now, because we're moving into the younger age groups, which are now taking much more of the strain. So of you're the going to be able to fill in the gap then because you have a gap of 30,000 that you're not vaccinating on Sundays. I, th I think you'll see that uh, figure improve as we go through the next week. So, so you, you mentioned rightly, it's perfectly legitimate, the figure on Sunday. But Monday, Tuesday, we vaccinated a record number uh, over a 24-hour period. And this week to date, uh, we've probably proportionately, of course, because our population is smaller, we've vaccinated about 30% more uh, than is the case in England. So we're catching up with that. But don't let me uh, just repeat the point here. Uh, it's really important to do this as fast as possible, but in the early stages of the programme, uh, we haven't just been going for overall numbers. We have deliberately been trying to maximise uptake in these most vulnerable groups, older people in care homes and the over 80s, because we know from our experience, these are the people that have been more likely to, to become very ill and die. So we've got uptake rates there that okay. are way beyond anything we see in the flu vaccination programme. And I think, although England's not published these figures yet, I think probably higher uptake in these groups talking, than in other parts of the UK. Yeah, um, talking about speed, 
The fact that the UK has managed to get its hands on vaccines because it's not part of the EU vaccination programme must be one of the most powerful arguments for Brexit. Um, it's certainly something that a lot of Remainers uh, have noticed uh, that they, you know, see as a benefit of our exit from the EU. But uh, back in July, one of your MPs, Dr Philippa Whitford, um, who's the SNP's Westminster's Europe and Health and Social Care spokesman, said, at a time when the UK should be accelerating efforts to work with our EU partners towards finding a vaccine, it is concerning that the UK government has instead rejected the opportunity to take part in yet another EU-wide programme. The UK government's short-sighted and increasingly isolationist approach does nothing but hinder the ability to tackle the virus effectively. Um, Dr Whitford was proved rather wrong, wasn't she? I think that's a, a bigger point, but look, I'm not going to sit here and say anything other than I think it's really good that the UK has managed to procure as much vaccine and that the UK as a whole is getting ahead in terms of vaccine. Of course, for any country, we all have an interest in seeing all countries get the populations vaccinated because this is a, a global pandemic. But I think the UK is in a very strong position. The, the vaccination procurement, uh, the, the approval of the vaccines, of course, uh, started mm -hmm. while the UK was still in the EU transition period. The, the rules around uh, the European Medicines Agency would have allowed that to happen anyway. So, yes, of course, you can make that <laughs> argument. But sometimes I think it's a slightly oversimplistic argument. But we should all be pleased that the vaccination programme is going so well, I think. Well, if, if, one of the, if one of the results of Brexit is that we can save more lives, I mean, that's, I, that's I an incredibly point. powerful I, I argument, think, isn't it? I think the point I'm making, and I, I recognise that at this particular moment in time, those who want to make that argument have got, uh, you know, ammunition to make it. I think it is an oversimplistic argument. The, the issues around Brexit are much wider uh, and more fundamental. But also, even on this narrow point, I, I think if you were to apply really detailed scrutiny, it wouldn't be quite that simple. The UK, even if it had still been in the EU under the rules of, of medicines approval, would still yeah. have been able to take decisions around uh, vaccines as it has done. But, you know, it's thoroughly a good thing uh, yeah. that the UK has got such good supplies. Now, obviously, all of us uh, want to make sure those supplies keep flowing. The UK government procures on a four nations basis. That is something we voluntarily sign into. But it's a good thing and we should be pleased about okay. it. Uh, one of the other drivers for lots of our viewers this morning, as you can imagine, Nicola Sturgeon, is schools. A lot of them struggling with homeschooling, desperate to get their kids back to school when it's safe uh, for both the teachers and for the children. A lot of schools, of course, as we know, are still open. They're looking after vulnerable children and the children of key workers. Um, you've announced that your schools will be going back, hopefully will be going back, uh, before schools in England. Um, and, and interestingly, I wonder what reassurance you can give to our Scottish viewers this morning who have children going back to school, because... Uh, the R rate in Scotland is very similar to the R rate in England, and yet Boris Johnson is consistent with this, that the 18th of March is going to be the earliest... 8th March. The 8th of March, excuse me, is going to be uh, the earliest that we can even start considering getting a phased return to schools in England. However, you're going for the, the 22nd of February, mm. it seems. Well, I mean, your point about the R rate is right, but the R rate is only one indicator, an important one. Our infection levels are lower, incidence and prevalence of the infection are lower than in England and other UK nations. That's actually consistently been the case right throughout this first wave, although they've been too high and at times going up at uh, an alarming rate. So that's, that's one factor. Uh, but secondly, we're taking a very, very gradual and phased approach here. So on the 22nd of February, Hopefully, what we will see are uh, preschool age children return to early years education, primaries one, two, three in Scotland uh, return to full time education, and a very, very small number of senior phase pupils who will be in school for practical coursework that is important for the certification of their qualifications. But in secondary schools, uh, that will not exceed about five to eight percent of the secondary. Uh, school rules. Are so we're taking introducing a any particular school. extra measures. I know that the uh, that there was a big campaign uh, in England to get teachers vaccinated mm. before uh, children were let back en masse into the classrooms. And I wonder if that you've considered that as part of your vaccine rollout. So we, in terms of the order of priority of vaccine, we all take the advice of the JCVI. Now, many teachers will be vaccinated in that priority list uh, because of age or probably more likely because of underlying health conditions. But the reason they have recommended that list is that these are the people most clinically vulnerable. So if we were to prioritise 
healthier groups uh, at this stage, we'd be deprioritizing people who really were clinically vulnerable. The, the trick here is to get through the whole population as quickly as possible. There's also the fact that we don't yet know the impact of the vaccine, although the early indications are good on transmission. So it's not the case that just because we vaccinated teachers, that would take away transmission possibilities in schools. That's why we've got to have other mitigations in place. I think Scotland was first to bring in a requirement for face coverings, uh, particularly in senior uh, schools. So there's lots of work to make schools as safe as possible, but we know the damage that is being done to young people uh, by being out of school. Yeah. So as far as we can, consistent with safety, safety cannot be compromised. Okay. And the danger, of course, well, it, the danger, of course, is that students go back to school and they may pick up the virus from mixing and they may bring that back home. So if you have not reached your target of vaccinating all the over 70s by the 15th of February, will you change uh, the plan to return schools on the 22nd? Well, we will meet our target for vaccinated over 70s by the 15th of February. So that's a, a hypothetical question, but we're on track to meet that target.